Should the Pittsburgh Steelers pay wide receiver Deontay Johnson true wide receiver one money? Will they pay him wide receiver one money? Will they sign him to an extension? All those questions are being stirred around Steeler Nation when it comes to their future wide receiver, especially with this huge wide receiver class in front of us. We'll talk about that and something that may be aiding Brian Flores' lawsuit against the NFL. I'm Chris Carter of the Locked On Steelers podcast, joined by Jenna Harner of Channel 11 WPXI. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things of the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button on the video. Hit the subscribe button to get all of our daily updates from our YouTube channel. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Remember to rate us five stars with a positive comment on Apple Podcasts, and you'll get a special shout at the end of the show. Joining me, as always, on Fridays is Jenna Harner from Channel 11 WPXI. Jenna, how you doing this week? Chris, I am wonderful. It's a Friday. Again, yes, we it made is. it to another, the end of the week again. And we are inching closer and closer to the NFL draft. It does not feel real that it is almost draft season. It does not feel real. It's crazy that, you know, it's, it feels like, you know, it, we just, I feel like we just got out of the Super Bowl. And, yeah. uh, and, and here we are. Free agency is, is it done, but it's been the, the worst, the, the, the worst of it's been done. So now everyone's gearing up. We have less than three weeks to the start of the draft. So there's a lot of hype there. But right now, there's a lot of hype also around the Deontay Johnson situation with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And this started Andrew Filipomi of 93.7, the fan in Pittsburgh, tweeted out that he had a source that says that Deontay Johnson is now feeling himself and wants a five-year deal for around $90 million. $90 million. Now, you do those you do those numbers. That's about $18 million a year. Of course, this happens right around the time Stephon Diggs just got paid super wide receiver one money from the Buffalo Bills. And now that begs the question, should the Steelers pay him that rate if that's really what he's demanding right now? And there's there's been a lot of different feels about that. There's some people saying, oh, they should just trade him, get rid of him, get, get, get some draft picks for him. There's people saying, do sign him, don't sign him. I think it's important to look at where that compares him to right now. If you were to compare him to other wide receivers in the NFL, other guys with, that have signed deals that are paying around an average of $18 million a year, Kenny Galladay, who's with the Giants, Christian Kirk, who just signed a big deal with the Jacksonville Jaguars, Michael Thomas is at $19.2 million, Chris Godwin is at $20 million, Amari Cooper's deal that's the that transfer from the Cowboys to the Browns is at $20 million. Those are the kind of deals that you're looking at around, around there. Um, but Jenna, when you look at Deontay Johnson, this is a guy who this year, the, he's been a guy that's been developing as a Pittsburgh Steeler. He just had 1,161 receiving yards and eight touchdowns, the most he's had in, in his time with the Pittsburgh Steelers and Ben Roethlisberger's worst year. So there's definitely that. But the drops have still been an issue. He did decrease it. He he dropped. Um, excuse me. I just had those numbers. He had 15 recorded drops, according to Pro Football Focus in 2020. And and then he had eight drops in 2021 a, a good decrease but still yeah. that's six percent of the uh, of passes that, that he's dropped and that's a high number for wide receiver one and i feel like we saw a lot of those towards the end of the season last year like in the beginning of the season and probably through the midway point it felt like he wasn't dropping balls the way that we saw him do it the season prior the 2020 season but mm -hmm. again yeah if you are gonna be that guy for this team wide receiver one those can't happen. And will there be another progression this year where, you know, maybe he only has a few drops because again, there's going to be a couple, you're not going to have a perfect season for a wide receiver. That's extremely rare, but you, if you are going to be the guy you're expected to go up and make those catches and realistically on this roster, as he stands right now, I, in my eyes, he's absolutely that guy, but he still has to prove it. And I think we saw him take so many steps, you know, he was the first one on the field every single day yes. working with tennis balls, you know, throwing hours before game time, just getting ready, getting in that mindset. If you see him continue to take steps forward, absolutely, then I think it's worth that. But I think the Steelers right now probably are also like, all right, you're asking for this from us. Here's what we're going to ask for for you. Yeah, that I think that's the situation the, Steel, the, the, the Steelers are in. 
they need they need if if I'm giving you that kind of money, you are definitely wide receiver one. There's no maybes. There's no are your drops gone. It's definitely that. And here's my thing: the Steelers should I, I think they should hold serve right now. Don't make any big moves. Say Deontay Johnson. All right. Uh, we're going to put you out there with Mitch Trubisky. We'll see how you do this year. And if you put up numbers, if the drops are are, 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 are decreasing, good. Then we'll then we'll talk about that deal after the season's over and, and, and get that situated. But if you're not, then there's no reason to sign that big deal. And I, I do think this kind of pushes the Steelers into a situation where they need to be prepared should that be the case, which means you may need someone else to be around your roster who's ready to step up into the wide receiver one role, whether that's Chase Claypool, a free agent signing like Jarvis Landry, or, uh, you know, a, a one, you know, some of these rookies in this draft class. Yeah, no. And that's kind of an area too. We know that this draft class has some really talented guys at the wide receiver position. And I keep seeing, you know, talks of, Oh, are they going to get a receiver in the first round? I wouldn't expect that, you know, but again, crazier things have happened. Again, I don't anticipate it being likely, but there is a deep class there that maybe you can find a guy or at least someone, again, I feel like we go back to draft talk all the time, but someone that can challenge Deontay Johnson because it feels like at least since the time that I've been covering this team, since I've been here in Pittsburgh, that it's kind of just, oh, Deontay Johnson is, you know, he, they all had their roles. Deontay Johnson had his, Juju Smith-Schuster has hit, had his, Chase Claypool had his. Now, especially too with the emergence of Pat Fryermuth, yes, understanding he's a tight end, but what he can do, his versatility, his playmaking abilities, especially when they get into the red zone. If I'm Deontay Johnson also, I'm understanding the game plan, but I'm also like, hey, I'm this guy. Target me. Trust me to make that catch, to make that big play. I will be your guy. So if he is, I, I kind of like what you're saying there too with, you know, let's see what happens with him and Trubisky. Let's see the dynamic those two create. And again, more likely than not, everybody keeps saying, oh, it's going to be, you know, Mason Rudolph's job. And we'll see what happens with the quarterback right. competition. It's a whole other topic. But realistically, you would assume that it's going to be Trubisky. Let's see how the two can create some chemistry. Let's see what they're able to do so that at the end of the season, Deontay can come to them and say, hey, look, here's everything you saw I put out on the field, what I did, how I was able to help this team, the way that we won, the way I showed you growth in myself. I deserve this money because you look at a guy like Stefan Diggs, there was a reason he got paid. Yeah. And I'm not saying that there's not a reason for Deontay Johnson. I'm just saying that I think there's still a little bit more we need to see from him in terms of his growth before they can be like, you know what? You are absolutely that guy that we want to be. You know, not that they don't want him. I don't mean it like that. But you are absolutely that guy that we're going to give all that money to because we know you can be counted on to make all those plays. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing is that if you're paying, especially like right now, the Steelers are forming whatever their nucleus is going to be to start the, you know, the, the post Ben Roethlisberger era, which means yeah. you're, you're committing to money for TJ Watt. You've committed to money for Cam Hayward. They're about to commit to money for Minka Fitzpatrick. We talked about all that on yesterday's show with Josh Taylor, but Deontay Johnson is a question to say, Hey, you know, he hasn't been the superstar wide receiver that Minka has been at safety that TJ has been at, at edge rusher that Cam has been as an interior defender defensive lineman he's been a star and I, I even say his 1100 plus yards last year receiving was very impressive considering where Ben was in his career and like Absolutely. when I look back at the end of the season I'm like wait a minute he's over a thousand you, you, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't think that and the idea maybe there's like hey if he had a quarterback that could hit him deep that could stretch the field a little bit maybe he would be putting up the 1500 type yard season and everyone would be talking about him a lot more. And maybe that's his rationale is he's like, you know, I can get there, but the Steelers, yeah. I think they need to hold serve and say, you know what? We think you can, but we got to see it first. Yeah. And looking at a uh, spo track spot track, however you say it on Twitter, the, um, that account, you know, with the wide receiver market value going up just because of yes. how much these guys are getting paid. Um, they ballpark, Johnson's contract around four years and 88 mil. So that seems to be kind of right in line there. I mean, you look at some of the other guys here. I mean, Cooper Cup, my goodness, uh, 113 mil there. Uh, Terry McLaurin, just under 100 mil at 97.7. DK Metcalf, 97.1. So realistically, the closest number right now I'm looking to uh, Deontay is Debo Samuel, four years, 90 million. You, if you're telling me to pick between two guys, I almost would a little bit lean more towards Debo right now. Again, until we can see a little more of that, you know, guarantee from Deontay Johnson, I would put him, you know, if that is 
100%. I'd say right now I'd probably put him in that 88% fall mark, ballpark because we know what he's capable of, clearly, but it's can you show it on a more consistent basis? Can you be that reliable guy every single game, 99% of the plays for you to make yourself that worth it to say, hey, we are going to pay you that money. We'll talk about that in a more in a sec here because I think it's also important to take into fact of this wide receiver class and what might happen when, when, when they pick guys out of here because I do think the Steelers will pick not just one but two wide receivers out of this draft class because they'll be they'll be looking to load up their position a little bit and get and get younger there. But before we do that, we got to talk about our friends at BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. You can find out all the latest sports developments, including this week's Masters Championships odds, podcasts, and reviews for all the different leagues this season if you want to bet on the masters there's no better place than to go to betonline.net right now because betonline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information including live betting esports and scores with major league baseball under underway you'll want to put money down on your favorite baseball teams be sure to check out all the odds and all the contests available when you go to betonline.net so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about all the trends in the action at betonline where the game starts Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm Chris Carter. She's Jenna Harner, and we're talking about your Pittsburgh Steelers. We talked about Deontay Johnson and, and the things, and the, the 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 chances or the strategy the Steelers should have in, a, in their approach to either signing him or just dealing with the wide receiver room as a whole. Now, it's important to remember. The Steelers wide receiver position, the Steelers have been known for drafting really well at wide receiver. You look at all the years, even guys they couldn't keep. You know, Juju Smith Schuster's with the Chiefs now. Uh, you think of the guys like Mike Wallace being signed away for big for, for big dollars, Emmanuel Sanders being signed away for big dollars, Antonio Brown, a six round pick, being the best receiver in football for six straight years. The those type of things are what the are what the Steelers kind of built up as a reputation now and now some people were looking at whoa they just have Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool is that done I think part of it is hey you know what some of their picks haven't worked out Ben Roethlisberger's at the tail end of his career they had a year where they had Mason Rudolph and Devlin Hodges as their best quarterbacks that's going to put a damper on things but I do think that they want an emphasis to say hey we have youth at the wide receiver position because and this is a big reason why I think they're going to pick two wide receivers not just one but two wide receivers in this draft class Jenna because Say, say Deontay Johnson does work out this year and you pay him the big bucks. Well, if you have two wide receivers that are young and up, up and comers, when Chase Claypool's contract is coming up in, in a year or two, then you're not pressured into signing him. No. And, and because you have two young guys as well. But if Deontay Johnson's contract doesn't work out, you have Chase Claypool and those two young guys to work out with, as well as any other veteran that, that, that you might sign. This is the if this is why I think you're not, it's important to note that over the over the past. Um, over the past several years, the last time the Steelers selected a wide receiver in the first round was 2006 when they got San Antonio Holmes, their Super Bowl MVP of Super Bowl 43. I I'm not guaranteeing they pick in the first round, Jenna, but I, I look at the speed in this class and it's undeniable. The talent is undeniable that you can get one or two guys to help yourself uh, in, in, in the coming years. Yeah, and we've talked about this too, but wide receiver is kind of one of those positions that you can find a lot of the talent, not necessarily in the early, early rounds type thing. You know, yeah, there are going to be a lot of good guys, but again, you're addressing needs. I think the bigger areas of need, just because, yes, there's always wide receivers every year. There's always every position, of course, but there are bigger positions of need that the Steelers, we assume, are going to probably target in the first round versus, hey, we need this guy. You know, there are going to be a lot of guys there in the second, third round, um, even the fourth round, too. Again, you know, you always you go back to Antonio Brown and, you know, finding him in the sixth round. Is that going to be the case? Not all the time, but this is a deep class in the way that you'll be able to find that. But I do kind of like that idea because this is just the way that the NFL works with the salary cap. You know, you're not able to have all of these explosive, explosive playmakers. So when you have younger guys on their rookie deals that really perform really well, like what we saw with Chase Claypool in his first season, then you kind of can build around that and say, hey, we know for the next handful of years here, three to five years, we're going to have a lot of continuity and we're going to have a really talented offense because of the fact that you don't have to pay all of these guys immediately. Exactly. And 
like you said, wide receivers position. And it seems also in the college ranks, there's a lot of wide receivers coming out every year. Yeah. Like, like, and, and a lot of really talented ones too. It's, mm-hmm. you know, superstar guys year after year after year. I mean, you think about it, it right here in Pittsburgh. We see Jordan Addison every day. Like I was just at pit, at pit practice watching him and Pat Narduzzi, the, the pit, pit Panthers head coach was telling me how like, yeah, we had a goal line situation in, in a scrimmage and we threw it up to Jordan Addison in between two of our best corners. He snatched it and the two guys are like, what were we supposed to do? How are we supposed to stop him? That guy's coming down the line. And then there's, yeah. and there's more like him every year. Alabama's always seems to be producing five student superstar wide receiver ones a year. This is something that you can get every year, but we we saw a historic number of receivers test and, and you know show so, you know sub four four speed, which is true. If you're running four four two, you're you're fast. You you're you're you got speed. If you're running four four flat, you're the lightning. If you're sub four four, I can't touch you. Like 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 that's that that's the kind of speed that that you're exhibiting there. And if you can combine that with strong hands, good route running, the willingness to block. That's what people. That's what's going to attract people a, a lot. And you see, guys, even if you go outside of Chris Olave, who a lot of people have penciled in as their wide receiver two, wide receiver three, Garrett Wilson, the other Ohio State wide receiver, Jamison Williams. We'll see how far he, how far he falls. Drake London. All those guys are like top dog. You even go into the second round. Sky Moore out of Western Michigan is getting a lot of attention. Christian Watson is getting a lot of attention. Calvin Austin the third of Memphis. George Pickens, who Mike Tomlin was watching very closely at George's pro day. All of these guys line up as potential like, hey, you could pick them in the second round as the Pittsburgh Steelers. You could come back, pick pick another guy in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, whatever, and say, all right, we added two young guys to the room, just like they did when they drafted Emmanuel Sanders and Antonio Brown after they had to trade away San Antonio Holmes back in yeah. 2010. And you could put yourself in a position to say, hey, you know what? We took these two stabs at it, whether it's Mitch Trubisky for the next three three years or if it's, you know, they go and draft their quarterback next year, you'll have the wide receivers in place, at least the talent and the prospects to, to grow from there and continue to build out your room. Yeah, no, absolutely, too. And again, it's just kind of that way. I think something also that I want to see is some of these younger guys looking to challenge Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool this yeah. season when they come in, if they come in, because I think like we talked about too, you want to see steps from both of these players. And I think especially with Chase mm-hmm. Claypool, we saw a little bit of, I don't want to say regression, but you expect a lot more from him after what we saw from him in his first season. So I think for me, that's something I want to see too, is, you know, bringing these young guns in and we know how those guys will respond. I think you just kind of, we hear Mike Tomlin talk about it all the time, iron sharpens iron, but elevating that level, continuing to surge where it's like, hey, I'm going to go out and compete because at the end of the day, I'm going to make myself better, but we're all going to make each other better around, you know, all of us too. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to take a break from this. When we come back, there's a major development in the NFL that involves Brian Flores, current Steelers linebacker coach, and involves actually two other former assistants under the Pittsburgh Steelers that could be coming be be part of some huge NFL news. We'll be talking about that in in just a second here on the Lockdown Steelers podcast. But first, we got to talk to you guys about Built Bar. Built Bar is, of course, the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. And if you're starting to, to feel like, man, I can't keep up with the diet that I have, I, there's, I always want to taste something good. I need a snack that's helping me stick, get through it in between my salads or my tough meals. This is where Built Bar comes into play. You can also try out their Puffs flavors because they're the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, marshmallow and covered in 100% real chocolate. You'll feel like you're cheating on your diet, but you won't actually will be. And you can do that with flavors like cinnamon churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, or even regular Built Bars that are also covered in 100% real chocolate. And those are low in calorie, but high in protein. When you eat a pro- when you eat a, a Built Bar, you're getting 130 calories four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. That's that's a completely different side of things when you go to the average candy bar. That's 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. You're helping yourself out so much by helping your taste buds and helping your health. And when you go to Built.com, you can find all the different flavors like double chocolate, coconut almond, peanut butter brownie, raspberry, cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, and so many more. And they're adding new limited time flavors every single month. So go to Built.com right now, and when you do order Order your built bars to be delivered right to your door. You can use the promo code LOCKED15. That's L O C K E D 1 5, LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order of built bar, built bars when you order them from built.com.
Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm Chris Carter. She's Jenna Harner. And let's step away from the wide receiver position for a little bit. Let's talk about some, some coaching stuff. This is actual news. And what's crazy is it's kind of like retroactive news. It's someone that some, someone dug, dug up. Now, of course, we know Brian Flores is suing the, the, the NFL for racial discrimination practices that they haven't been actually following the Rooney rule. He alleged that when he was interviewing for the, the Giants position that they had already picked out a, a white coach before he had interviewed and the and the Rooney rule had stated you're supposed to interview with the interview black head head coaching candidates with the intent of seeing seeing if they could win, win the job and he found out through inadvertent text messages with Bill Belichick who, who accidentally revealed to him that Brian Dable was going to be the Giants head coach and that uh, uh Brian Flores's interview was a sham and just a uh, just a show of face which you know, show which which brings in the question of racial discrimination there. So, all that being said, there's been a lot of questions as far as the validity of it. There's other coaches who have said that they were part of it, and Ray Horton, a former Steelers secondary coach, is now had had alleged the same thing of the Tennessee Titans in 2016. He was their defensive coordinator for 2014 and 2015. He interviewed with them to be their 2016 head coach, and he felt like for a while like there was something weird about his interview. That those feelings were confirmed by former Steelers offensive coordinator Mike Mularkey, who won that job when he went on a a podcast actually two years ago, and it was actually the Steelers Realm podcast. One one of the the one thing that's out there. There's a lot of great Steelers content out there. I am not the only Steelers podcast. I tell people I love it when you're here, but do check out other people's content because there's there's things like this that you that, that you can miss. There's all there's always great content out there covering your Pittsburgh Steelers, but. The Steelers Round podcast in talking to Mike Malarkey two years ago, he came out and he talked about how he was told by the owner of the Titans that he had already gotten the job and that he knew that while they were interviewing Ray Horton. And he felt terrible that he didn't step up and say something then because he said that he's always told his kids to do the right thing and, and to, to always do the right thing when you know what the right thing is. And he felt ashamed that he did it. He, did, he didn't do it at that time. So now... This adds evidence to Horton's case, excuse me, to Flores' case. And now Horton's, along with the uh, former Arizona Cardinals head coach, Steve Wilkes, have joined Flores in his lawsuit. And Jenna, all of a sudden, this case that was, you know, pretty big about a month or two ago and calmed down because the NFL had other news, this case just picked up a lot more steam. Yeah, this is something, too. Again, the evidence here if it kind of continues to go this way, because we're seeing, I feel like initially when it was filed, we saw obviously Flores and what he alleged, but then usually sometimes, I don't want to say usually because I am no law expert. Chris will turn to you for that one. But usually <laughs> in that case, you do kind of see more and more evidence kind of come to light in scenarios like this. And for with this Ray Horton situation here too, this is something that does give a little bit more traction because at the end of the day, I think the thing is, is just you, you want the NFL to be following the Rooney rule. It's there. It's in place. You want to bring in diverse candidates and hire the best possible candidate, but you want to give the diverse candidates, black head coaches, women, Asian mm -hmm. people of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. You want to give these people opportunities. That's the whole point behind it. And I know it can be a little bit of a touchy subject for a lot of people, but the basis of it, it, it shouldn't be. It's just giving people opportunities who may not have had it in the first place. Because when you look at the NFL right now, there are two now because of Bruce Arians stepping down. There are two black head coaches in a league that is dominated by black players. Uh, and I, I, I think I, I think there's three. Th I think there's three now because Lovey Smith is the head coach of the Texans. But to your point, that's, uh, yeah, it, that's right. I'm sorry. We, but 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 no, but no, no. But, but to your but to your point, that's still a very small number. There used to be, I think, eight at one point, and it's drilled yeah. down to where bef right before Lovey Smith, and then retroactively. Um, uh, the blanket on the guy who just replaced Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians, uh, yeah. Uh, Todd, uh, Todd, Todd, Todd Bowles, thank you. Todd Bowles, uh, I could, yeah. I, it, it took me a second to get there. But um, before those two were, were, were promoted into those positions, Mike Tomlin was the only black head coach in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And that was what made everyone say, whoa, wait a second, something's wrong here. And Brian Flores, you know, his, his lawsuit was timed with that. Now, I, I will say, Jenna, when we're talking about this discussion, and, you know, and I've I studied employment discrimination when I when I when I got my degree from Pitt Law when uh, I even did an employment discrimination seminar I am no employment discrimination expert I am not saying that I know everything when it comes to this 
but I am going to going to say from you know from what I remember and how I can basically describe things here in podcast form without getting to too much legal jargon and boring our listeners and viewers. The basic it's really hard to get employment discrimination cases when it comes to race and, and, and prove them completely outright. The, there's there's two main methods that I remember how it was supposed to work. And one is called the smoking gun. And the smoking guard is very hard to get because you basically need testimony or hard evidence that the owner, that the person that you're alleging discriminated against you did that thing, did the thing that you alleged them to. And it's very hard to do that because oftentimes these are emails. These are face-to-face conversations with people that will never out themselves or never out the person that that you're accusing. And so a lot of times you don't get smoking gun cases. Those are very rare in, 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 in the legal world when it comes to employment discrimination. So, Um, So that that's been a concern this whole time is that nobody would step forward. And here you have Mike Malarkey did it years ago and said, this is what's going on. Now, there's some you you could you could argue, well, race still didn't play a factor into that. You could say it it was they they never brought up race in that conversation. It was just about they had their guy and they were just going to interview other people just to interview other people. Sure. But this goes right exactly to what Brian Flores has been saying, what Steve Wilkes has been saying, and what Mike Tomlin and the Roonies have supported Brian Flores mm-hmm. in, his, in his statements. And again, all those guys, black coaches who are bring, bringing up this as a part of it. And we've already been revealed the Miami Dolphins themselves who got rid of Brian Flores, the only coach that had back to back winning seasons over the last two decades for their organization. It's well known they called Mike Tomlin a hip hop coach or said he had too much hip hop to, to to be their head coach back when he was making the rounds decades ago. So I I look at this Jenna and I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the the automatic smoking gun that, that automatically wins the case, but no. it it adds to the to the idea of the other way to win these cases, which is called like disparate impact. It's a long story. I'm not going to try to explain it because I'm not even I'm not even smart enough right now to do this off the cuff because I haven't studied employment discrimination in like years. But basically, you need to be able to provide data and evidence that shows along with the hard evidence of your case there. It is a factor here. They're like there's institutional racism. There's practices here that don't benefit people of color, minorities, women, et cetera. And I think this is, is, is something that's can add real ammunition into the case of what Brian Flores and other coaches are making. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it, it's a very valid case. It's a very valid point to be making because of, you know, kind of everything that we've talked about. Um, but the fact too, that, you know, you have more alleged evidence here to say, Hey, this is exactly what I'm talking about. We just want change. We just don't Mm -hmm. want this to happen. We don't want you to go into an interview knowing, hey, this is definitively going to be our guy. That's pretty much, at least from the surface of a little bit, that is a large majority of what Brian Flores is fighting for here. It's exactly what he's fighting for. He's just saying, listen, when I when I interview with someone, I want to know that I'm interviewing someone because I'm actually getting a real opportunity. And I'm not just being passed around. I mean, there's, there's also the accusation of the Denver Broncos doing the same thing, being drunk or like or, or hung over at interviews that they knew weren't serious. It's a problem that is being alleged to be a part of the culture in the NFL to happen with minority coaches and to say, like, you're not getting real opportunities. You're just kind of being you're kind of being saying brought in here. Hey, we're going to appease this Rooney rule because we don't really care about actually making our league more diverse. We don't care about your opportunities or or the things that you've gone through. We're just doing this so that we can get out of stay out of trouble and we can do what we've wanted to do this whole time. And that's what Brian Flores is, 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 is his, in his lawsuit is striking at the heart of. So I'm very intrigued to see how this plays out. What more information? I mean, this is just what a month or two after his his lawsuit came out. Yeah, Th- this is just that this is just something that we're starting to unearth. I can only imagine what more things might get, get unearthed from yeah. other coaches in, in as, as we continue to look at this and other people start to dig into and find more information. Because again, you know, it's kind of almost that domino effect here where you see one, you see two, and then it kind of could be, hey, this happened to me. Hey, I know this happened to this person. You know, they can kind of have that snowball effect. Absolutely. There can be a lot of different things that happen here. We will keep you up to date with this as well as the Steelers wide receiver situation, NFL draft, and all the things happening on in the NFL and and with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jenna, thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. It's always great to have you on. Uh, We we look forward to having you on next week as well. But before then, please let people know where they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. 
Well, Chris, thank you so much for having me. As always, I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday, wonderful week ahead. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jenna Harner 11, Instagram, Jenna underscore Harner, uh, and right here on this podcast and on uh, Channel 11 WPXI here in Pittsburgh. We're uh, doing a lot of really cool stuff, so stay tuned. They do a lot of really cool stuff there. I'm Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers podcast. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can find this show, the Locked On Steelers podcast, on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. Like this video if you saw it on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all of our daily content. And uh, also, you'll see me on Channel 11 with the final word this Sunday night at 1135. So holla at me. I'll be on there as well. Um, if you want to help the, about the show even further, go on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review along with a positive comment. Do both at the same time. You'll get a shout-out at the end of the show. Uh, the end of the show thanks so much we'll be back in your ears and on your screens on monday talking more about your pittsburgh steelers